The next uh, speaker is Sean Sweeney. Sean is the coordinator of Trade Unions for Energy Democracy based at the University of New York. And uh, Sean was saying earlier on uh, that in New York they've had some torrential uh, downpours, flooding um, on a scale they hasn't seen before. So thankfully you're here <laughs> and hopefully your feet aren't too wet, Sean. Uh, thank you very much for coming along and please address the conference. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, it's a, a real privilege to be part of uh, this discussion. I'll try to keep the time. Um, as Steve said, I coordinate a project called Trade Unions for Energy Democracy. It's 88 unions from 26 countries. The most recent union that joined was the oil workers in Chile um, who are um, facing the same kind of attacks we're seeing um, all over the world in, in terms of uh, environmental as well as social um, uh, setbacks. Uh, I want to congratulate the uh, Just Transition Partnership for the years of work uh, they've done in putting um, a vision for Scotland on the agenda, protecting workers, but also putting the issue of public energy into the discourse. And I was um, really thrilled to hear again uh, what the STUC is doing. Ross, your comments were tremendous. And we circulated your last contribution to the two ed meeting uh, very widely indeed, because what the issue for us uh, in the TUED network is, is the question of ownership is not just an add-on demand, it's a central demand. And we believe that the trade union movement should make it its top demand. Because the if we don't own the energy system in particular, but we can say the same of transport, we can say the same of uh, the financial system, then we're not going to be able to address the climate emergency. This is, um, I think, the, fund the point of departure. This then makes Glasgow for me, and I've been to many COPs. I, my first COP was in Bali, Indonesia in 2007, at which time the head of the IPCC gave a report that lasted several hours in front of thousands of delegates. And he said that 2012 was the tipping point. And if we don't start reducing emissions by 2012, we will not stay within the well below two degrees or the two degrees target as it was then. Now the science is telling us it's 1.5 and now emissions are continuing to rise, except for, of course, the year of COVID, but now we see emissions continuing to go up. And I'm gonna um, kind of put a, uh, one of my uh, comrades, Irene, is going to put in a, a chart in the chat. I hope comrades can open it because it shows the, the issue of transition in the context of energy consumption. She's just put it in there. So um, hopefully the um, participants in this call will be able to access it. This shows, I think, this chart shows the enormity of the challenge we face. We've got energy consumption rising and we've got a transition that's barely got off the ground. In fact, I think it's valid to say that what COP26 can do is spread awareness that despite all the years of pledges and promises, we are not going in the right direction. This is hugely important for the social movements and the trade union movement is to not go along with the idea that the transition is inevitable, that there's, you know, we're on our way to a low carbon future. There are a lot of changes going on in the world. There's no doubt about that. And we know that there is a growth in renewable energy, but what we're seeing globally is an energy expansion, not an energy transition. There's more and more fossil fuels coming into the system. This is the emergency. It's not the problem of ambition. In many ways, governments will come to Scotland like they have in the last two years, three years, talking about net zero targets. They talk about 100% um, renewable energy targets. It's all nonsense. What we see is the reality is that the energy use continues, emissions continues to rise. Ambitions and pledges, we have bucket loads of them. Paris made commitments. Before that, there were other commitments. The problem is, and this is where we have to see Glasgow as an absolute tipping point, or in terms of a political tipping point, is those pledges and commitments are routinely not being met. It's not because politicians don't get it, 
Many of them do get it. The problem is they preside over a system of accumulation and profit so that any transition which requires doing less is not acceptable. We can see it in Scotland with the way the renewable sector is behaving. So yes, I was pleased that Sharon can point to one or two examples of where renewable energy companies are doing this or that. But I have to take issue with one or two of the things she said. First of all, yes, the big oil companies are shifting money into renewables, certainly offshore wind. The problem though is that's because they see an expansion, not just in oil and gas, but they see an expansion in renewables. So they wanna make some money out of the deal. Now, the Issue, I think, though, uh, is um, that the, the, the demands that we have to make on public ownership are therefore um, crucially important. And that's why we're really looking forward as CHUED uh, and to bring unions uh, or be part of the unity, uh, the, the community of unions who will be in Glasgow, putting public ownership of energy high on the agenda, along with the STUC, Public Services International and others. Now, I think I'm old enough to remember the Upper Clyde shipbuilders struggle of the 1970s. We, uh, this is when workers took over the shipyards and made international news. That kind of militancy is absolutely essential if we're going to turn consciousness around. What would it mean if there was serious stoppages during Glasgow COP26, where workers just didn't say to leaders, we need more ambition. And youth didn't just say to elected officials, do your job, but actually point to what is the fundamental problem is that we do not control vital sectors of the economy where we can implement a policy of, of decarbonization that is based on protecting jobs, social and global justice, and solving or beginning to address uh, the crisis that we face. Now, Tony Mazzocchi's name came up. Ross, thank you for reminding us of his legacy. Tony in invented is not the word, but he coined the term just transition and other comrades in his union. And, but there was a much more broader agenda there than just protecting workers from a transition. That's a very important, concept just transition and we applaud the unions who worked so hard for over a decade to get just transition into the preamble of the Paris Agreement. That was an enormous achievement but the original concept was a transformative social vision based on the fact that workers should not have to choose between making a living and hurting and harming the environment with their work that there needed to be protections. That's the point of departure. But the end point was much more radical social change. The ruling elite in the United States were terrified of Tony Mazzocchi. They did everything they could to red bait him out of politics. And yet he was one of the most respected leaders I've ever had the uh, pleasure and privilege of meeting. He really understood what's needed. So I think we are, the reason why I think COP26 is going to be so important is because there needs to be in the trade unions and in the environmental movement, a change in terms of not just calling for more ambition from leaders who will not be able to deliver because they preside over a basically expanding capitalist economy, but we put the question of ownership on the agenda. One of the speakers, and I'll close with this point, made the um, focused on the unjust transition that's going on in Scotland, where workers in Bifab, in Fife and elsewhere are basically not getting the work they were promised from the renewables industry. The truth is, this is the global pattern. Companies will not invest unless they have guaranteed profits and they will do a race to the bottom in order to fulfill contracts. If we're in a position to fight for a global public goods agenda, and we'll be in, in the COP organizing alongside Public Services International and others for that agenda, then we have an opportunity to really change the narrative. Last point I'll say is all of this year, we've been working really hard on a project called 
the Trade Union Task Force for a Public Energy Future. We felt it was necessary. There's a group of unions, up to 40, uh, anchored by FNME, the French uh, uh, energy unions affiliated to CGT, Public Services International, and ourselves in Chuet, but many other unions have participated in this project. We don't think it's enough to say public ownership is better than private ownership. We have to show why the neoliberal energy transition has failed. And we've gone into considerable detail to explain why carbon pricing, de-risking investment, all of these policies to so-called mobilize the private sector have been a complete and utter disaster. The second part of the report is to show what public energy companies can do in driving a just transition and an effective decarbonization. It's absolutely crucial to show the role of public energy companies. Now, of course, we know that means there are many existing public companies who operate like capitalist enterprises, but this is because the neoliberal laws of the 1980s and 90s have forced public institutions to compete in these so-called markets for energy. And the more energy they sell, the more revenues they create. The struggle for public ownership is happening in Mexico, in South Africa, in Scotland, and in other parts of the world. And certainly in France, where the French unions have mobilized to protect the privatization and breakup of the public energy company there. So we're looking forward to being alongside the comrades here in Glasgow. We're organizing and we're just applaud everything you've done to prepare us for what I think will be an extremely important intervention um, by by ourselves and others in at COP26. Thanks, comrades.